Um, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for um, kicking this uh, off. I um, want to spend some time looking at uh, this whole issue of uh, maritime security. As to echo um, Ian, enough with the threats. We've had a lot of conversations about the threats. We all know $1.4 billion worth of fish stolen from Africa's waters every year. We know we hear about piracy, and we hear about um, smuggling, we hear about pollution. We know what the threats are. I think the challenge facing us right now is how do we as African countries work together to ensure that this transnational maritime issue is addressed. What I want to do is talk less about uh, threats but more about um, opportunities. Um, what can we do? Um, uh, what is in the realm of the possible? But also I want to more deliberately compare maritime insecurity in West Africa and in the Horn of Africa, and to see if there are differences, um, if there are things that we could take from East Africa to make West Africa stronger and vice versa. Because we've um, all seen there seems to be this um, changing of the guard every four or five or six years. It's Horn of Africa, then it's back in Gulf of Guinea, and then back in the Horn of Africa. And you know, at some point you have to think that we could inform each other a little bit more deliberately. Um, and this is because um, Africa's maritime in environment is critical, not just to security, but also to well-being. Um, most of Africa's um, GDP is seaborne because it's trade-related. Whether it's natural resources or importing goods, our seas are crucial. Uh, when it comes to uh, nutrition, etc., our seas are crucial. And uh, when it comes to tourism, etc., our seas are crucial. And this is a map of um, showing um, mari uh, mar maritime traffic, and you could see that um, Africa is central, not just you know for the continent, but also for global um, traffic. And so this is an issue that is front and center that we really have to do something about. Before we start thinking about what we could learn from East and West, I think it's important to be honest in our analysis of what I'm calling maritime crime. Um, and if we take the last um, era of maritime instability in the Horn of Africa, the map to your, the um, top left shows how every year it seemed to be an ever-expanding um, scope of maritime crime. It started in and around Somali's territorial waters and ended up, you know, almost um, hitting India in terms of scope, how far it went. And this gives you, um, in your mind, a ripple effect, meaning that there is an epicenter somewhere and it is going out, further out every year from the epicenter. And so whatever strategic issue you think through for East Africa has to bear in mind two important things. One, there is an epicenter. And secondly, it is a combination of blue water, i.e. territorial waters, and, sorry, brown water, i.e. the territorial waters, and blue water, i.e. the high seas. So you have not just your national or regional treaties to consider, you have the treaties relating to the high seas and how much power project, naval power projection you could accommodate to address things that are happening all the way out in the Indian Ocean, but emanate from that epicenter that is in the Horn of Africa. Contrast that with West Africa. Bottom right is a snapshot of um, maritime crime 2016 where it happened. 
Africa, West Africa is like the mirror opposite. Because one, there is, no, there is no epicenter per se. It seems to be dotted in many places. But secondly, there's not a lot of blue water maritime crime. If you look at the um, data on maritime crime, you would see they categorize it according to where the crime happened. Indian Ocean, it's mainly when the vessels are moving, streaming. Gulf of Guinea, it's mainly when the vessels are either anchored <laughs> or moored. Mm -hmm. So it's a different dynamic. And it's usually within the territorial waters. And so while it is important to think through continental approaches, like the African Integrated Maritime <laughs> Strategy, the acronym in English is AIMS 2050, which is the African Union's overarching strategy, has to recognize that it is not dealing with the same threat everywhere on the continent. It's different. And I have, you know, Ian and I have talked about this, and uh, our other colleague, um, Dr. Malakiesh, that we really need to dissect AIMS 2050 to make it more relevant to the reality of mar that is maritime insecurity across the continent. So what do we do? In the maritime space, as in the um, airspace or the land space, we seem to be uh, fraught with what um, some people call the burden of legacies. Okay, these legacy relationships define what sort of approach we have to maritime insecurity, what sort of instruments we have at our disposal, what sort of external assistance we could, um, we could um, expect. For example, in, if you take in West Africa, you have a joint task force on maritime insecurity. You would have the gendarme on board. But you only have the gendarme if you have a French legacy system. A British legacy system, you'll have the Navy, you'll have the police. You don't have that hybrid capacity. So you send the Navy out, but the Navy does not have the power of arrest <laughs> or prosecution. You send the police out, they don't have the force to do it. A very simple example, but it is a fundamental challenge for strategy. We have to look beyond the burden of legacies to think how things like AIMS 2050, how things like Djibouti um, Protocol, Yaoundé Code of Conduct could begin to address these realities. Another reality is forget about the legacies con in contemporary terms. How do we define external partnerships? I'm mentioning this because whether it comes to um, maritime domain awareness, i.e. knowing what's in your maritime domain, or the ability to pursue, apprehend, and prosecute, um, most African countries, even those with the um, financial resources, just don't have the capacity. Uh, I was looking at some of the work on, that's been done on the challenge of prosecuting maritime crime. There are only few lawyers worldwide, and uh, Ian will bear me out, who really understand <laughs> the um, legislative framework for that. And so you have people being apprehended for smuggling. You look on the books, there are no laws against smuggling, so you charge them with trespassing in the territorial waters, give them a $5,000 crime, and they've just like stolen $10 million of fish, and that is problematic. So because of that, you know, most African countries are always going to be dependent on some form of external assistance. So the question then becomes, how do you distinguish between pat patronage and partnership? The relationship, when you say partnership, you're always assuming in a normal type of uh, dispensation that you have two partners. But really, it's an asymmetrical re relationship. 
Because those partners also have interests. <coughs> Take the Horn of Africa. Um, very little real estate separates the joint task force base with the new of, uh, that the United States occupies in Djibouti, with a new base being um, um, built by China. And so some people say, oh, yeah, it's good. Let's have both. But have you thought through that? <laughs> what does it mean for collaboration and your maritime security? So you have to be able to distinguish between partnerships and patronage. Um, uh, Ian went through some of the strategic issues, I believe, um, should be of um, uh, interest and should challenge us as we think through what we could learn from the West that could benefit the East and vice versa. Because it is clear to me, having looked at the data, the IMO data over the last God knows how many years, we do have this recurrence, and it's cyclical. It appears to be cyclical. <laughs> A recurrence of ma serious maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea and in the Gulf of Aden. And so what could we learn, not just from the typologies of maritime insecurity, but also the approaches that we've had? Uh, the first is the political dimension. As I mentioned, in the um, Indian Ocean, there's an epicenter. There is not in the Gulf of Guinea. But the issue, the, the political dimension is crucial because that's your leadoff point. You also need to think about the operational dimension. Um, that patronage, partnership issue we talked about later, it results in countries having capabilities that don't work together, or capabilities that they couldn't sustain or afford. And so what sort of operational level um, lessons could we take from the joint task force in the Horn of Africa that we could probably think about the Gulf of Guinea. The Gulf of Guinea is roughly, Gulf of Guinea narrowly defined, is roughly the size of the Gulf of Mexico here in the Americas. But the amount of crime and the capacity differences are huge. So we have to think about what lessons we could learn. In the Gulf of Aden, we had the multi, in, in international multinational task force, the Grand Armada that included um, strange bedfellows like uh, the Chinese People's Liberation Army and Navy and uh, US and European forces. Is that what we need in the Gulf of um, Guinea? And even if we needed some multinational patrolling capacity, what would it look like? We also have to think about the resource dimension. Um, uh, Gulf of Guinea is a lot more um, varied, but that could also be an opportunity because a lot of the wealth in the Gulf of Guinea, you know, is, depends on the sea. Um, whether you're talking about coffee and cocoa in um, La Côte d'Ivoire and um, Ghana, or oil in Angola and Nigeria, the sea is important. So there is a vested interest um, among these, you know, reasonably um, wealthy countries. but. You know, how do you ensure that there is coordination that delivers the sort of top cover? C contrast that with the epicenter issue in the Horn of Africa. Are there lessons that could be learned? Um, because what we have in the Gulf of um, Aden is a lot of international presence, but how does that align with a model to sustain regional capacity in the Gulf of Aden? Or does it, or does it not? And uh, does AIMS 2050 provide a framework to do that effectively? 
Then you have the, region, the regional dimensions. I'm not going to go into the um, differences, analyzing the differences between Ya the Yaoundé Code of Conduct and the Djibouti Declaration. I hear Djibouti was updated just a, just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Because Djibouti Declaration initially only focused on, on, on terrorism, mm -hmm. not on maritime cr crime um, broadly. But if you do a threat analysis in Djibouti's maritime environment, you'll find out that it's a lot more than just terrorism as internationally defined. Why was it, um, why was it um, articulated in that manner? And why did it take so long to update it? It has been updated now. What does that mean? Does Zone D in the Gulf of Guinea provide a template for the countries in the Gulf of Aden to operationalize an international um, agreement? We have, all these, we have all, all these questions and more. But I think when it comes to maritime security, uh, three things. One, we need to move beyond just talking about there are threats. We know them. Secondly, we have to be able to understand the, how different the, not just the threats, but the environments are across the African continent. Uh, we just did East and West. If we had time, we could have done North and South as well because we all see the North in, on CNN almost every other week, and the South is not that silent either. So how are we as strategic leaders thinking through our contribution to this? And thirdly, what does strategy look like? The issue might be, well, um, if we don't have the political will, we, can't do ve we, can't, we really can't do much. Uh, this is a complex and complicated issue. But I'm convinced that there is a lot of opportunity for us to exercise both operational and intellectual leadership in this space. Mm -hmm. I say so because I can point to one or two you know, examples. And probably my favorite example is now on the continent, the leading legal scholar on maritime security is arguably Kamal Ali Din in Ghana. And uh, guess where he attended his first maritime security um, event? The Africa Center. And he has gone on to be the defining voice into what strategy means, what law means, and everybody's listening to him. So it didn't require political will for him to exercise his own intellectual and operational leadership. And that's my challenge to you as well. And again, it may not just be maritime security, it's much broader, but particularly with maritime security, because as... Um, as both um, my friend uh, Matt and Ian mentioned, there is a lot of sea blindness, there is wealth blindness, and because we are so focused on land-centric threats. So I hope we'll have a broad conversation about you know, ways to deepen this, and thank you so much for listening.